To quote eminent scientist Tyler Durden, on a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everyone drops to zero. Actually, not necessarily. If the quantum multiverse is real, there may be a version of you that lives forever. In the last couple of episodes, we've been delving into a key mystery of quantum mechanics. Why don't we have quantum magical powers? Or more scientifically, what causes the divide between the weird behavior of the quantum world and our large-scale macroscopic world? In particular, what causes quantum systems to transition from simultaneously existing in many states at the same time to having only one clear observable state at the moment of measurement? This is the measurement problem. We've been exploring decoherence as a mechanism for this quantum classical transition. And we're not done yet. But today, I want to take a step back to think about and acknowledge something very important. By itself, decoherence does not solve the measurement problem. It only explains why separate branches of the wave function, separate alternate histories, stop being able to interact with each other. In order to understand what happens to those different branches and to understand why we find ourselves in one of them, we need to embrace one of the interpretations of quantum mechanics. For example, the, the Copenhagen interpretation, interpretation which says, says that the wave function branches, branches that we don't observe somehow vanish at the moment of measurement. Or the many worlds interpretation, which states that those other branches are just as valid as ours, implying that reality may split and multiply in all possible ways. In that case, we only see one branch because we live in that branch and the others are rendered inaccessible by decoherence. The problem with these interpretations is that on the surface, they seem untestable. We can't ever peer into those other realities, so how do we know they exist? Today, I'm gonna to offer a test. Admittedly, not a very useful test, but one that is very fun to think about. We'll call this test quantum immortality. It's based on the famous Schrodinger's cat thought experiment. As a refresher, a cat is in an opaque box with the vial of deadly poison, which is released on the radioactive decay of an atom. There's a totally random 50-50 chance of the radioactive decay over a certain period of time. That means the quantum wave function of the atom splits equally. The atom is simultaneously decayed and not decayed until we observe it. So then surely the cat's wave function splits too, into dead and alive. According to Copenhagen, one of these results becomes real when the physicist opens the box, while the other branch of the wave function vanishes. But in many worlds, both branches continue forever, and the physicist's wave function also splits in two, I guess into guilty and relieved? Neither version of the physicist knows about the other, and it seems like there's no way for them to confirm the existence of the other branch of the wave function. But there is one test a rather morbid one. The physicist could crawl into the box instead of the cat. And instead of a vial of poison attached to one radioactive atom, connect the vial to many atoms, so the poison is released if any of them decay. Let's be specific. There are 100 polonium-212 atoms with a half-life of 300 microseconds, so each atom has a 50% chance of decaying in that time. After 300 microseconds, the connection between the poison and the polonium is cut and the experiment is over. So what are the chances of the physicist surviving? Well, pretty bad, I guess. The chance that any one atom does not decay in that 300 microseconds is 50-50. But the chance that none of those 100 atoms decay is basically zero. It's 0.5 to the power of 100. If we run this experiment over and over, every 300 microseconds, we need to do it for nearly a million times the entire age of the universe in order for the physicists to be likely to survive once. But the point is that they can't repeat the experiment, at least according to the Copenhagen interpretation, which tells us that there's ultimately only a single result from each quantum event. So a single result from the Schrodinger's physicist experiment. According to Copenhagen, all branches of the wave function besides definitely dead get cut off with ruthless efficiency almost all of the time. But 
That's not true in many worlds, according to which all branches of the wave function persist. So even after trying this experiment even once, there'll be a branch of the wave function where the physicist opens the box and crawls out to the amazement of their lab assistant and hopefully their relief, although this physicist is clearly pretty whack, so who knows. The physicist now has very good evidence that many worlds is right because the chance of survival under any other interpretation of quantum mechanics is basically nil. Many worlds, on the other hand, guarantees their survival in at least one branch of the quantum wave function. The problem with this test is, of course, that 10 to the power of 30 physicists need to die in other timelines for one to crawl out of that box feeling smug. And essentially no one besides that one lucky physicist can ever know. Even in the rare survival timeline, everyone else will probably assume the experimental apparatus broke. This thought experiment is sometimes called quantum immortality. You could imagine that any process leading to mortality is ultimately a sequence of quantum events. So there are timelines in which those incremental steps towards death never happen. Well, keep that in mind before you try crawling into Schrodinger's box yourself. You're already testing many worlds just by existing. Hugh Everett, who first came up with the many worlds interpretation, actually believed in this sort of quantum immortality. He smoked three packs a day, drank heavily, didn't exercise, and died of a heart attack at age 51. At least in this timeline. Max Tegmark makes a good point regarding quantum immortality, which is that death is an incremental process, not a single quantum event. So the closer you are, the fewer many worlds timelines include your survival. And even if some insanely rare branches of your wave function keep you alive beyond your years, I'd advise you to quit smoking and do some crunches anyway. From where you stand now, your thread of consciousness is going to have to experience every single one of the bad future timelines. Might as well try to make more of them good. Also, many worlds might be wrong. I say live as though this is your one quantum timeline. While we're discussing dubious methods for predicting survival times, I think it's time to answer the Doomsday Challenge question. This was from our Doomsday Argument episode a couple of months back. Sorry to be slow, I wanted to check my results by making sure humanity survived at least this long. So far, so good. Anyway, if you want to try the challenge, you should pause here because spoilers. But to refresh your memory real quick, the argument goes like this. We are typical members of the human race, which means we should find ourselves at a typical point in the span of humanity's existence. So more likely near the middle of our species existence rather than right at the start or right at the end. Based on this, if we then infer that there are not likely to be too many more humans born after us than were born before us, then we can guess how much longer humanity has left. So the challenge question was this. If you are the 100 billionth person born, what are the chances that humanity will last until the year 3000? Assume population doubles every 100 years. The key is to figure out how many people will have been born by the year 3000, and then compare your birth rank to that number. If population is doubling every 100 years, there'll be around 7.7 .7 trillion people by then. But that's not the total people who existed up till then. For that, you need to include the ones that have died also. Now, people use different approaches, but they all amount to integrating an exponential birth rate over the next thousand years. Depending on some assumptions like the average lifespan, you get that something like 17 to 18 trillion people will have lived by the year 3000. That would place you in the first 0.6% of people who ever lived, and the doomsday argument argues that, therefore, there's less than a 1% chance that so many people will ever exist. Less than 1% that will make it to the year 3000. Now, some people use much more sophisticated probability arguments, including Bayesian analysis, or thinking in observer years rather than observer lifetimes. But none of that helped. The probability for humanity's survival to the year 3000 remained at around a percent or lower. 
Others pointed out that probably the global population will level off at 10 billion or so people, so it'll take a lot, lot longer to get to several trillion humans. That would push the 99% doomsday date to something like 10,000 years from now if we extend our average lifespan to 100 years. And the smaller the population is, the longer humanity lasts, according to the doomsday argument. This has nothing to do with sustainability, it's just this weird statistical argument. Which I guess means if the population was only 100 people, we'd last for trillions of years. Hmm, that does make the doomsday argument seem even more absurd. Anyway, if your name appears, you're one of the winners of the challenge question and you get your pick from the Spacetime merch store. Congrats, we'll shoot you an email to sort out your prize. We tried to make sure all correct answers got a prize in at least one quantum timeline. So if you didn't see your name here, please congratulate the other you who did. And to all of you, thank you for joining me on this wave function branch. I have a feeling it's going to be a hell of a ride, even if we're not a quantum immortal branch. So let's stick it to those alternate realities and make this the best of infinitely many diverging histories of space-time. Hey everyone, before we get to comments, I wanted to let you know about Antarctic Extremes, a new miniseries from Nova and PBS Digital Studios. Antarctic Extremes is about exploring how science is done in some of the harshest conditions on Earth. Caitlin Sachs and Alo Perez take you through the biology, the geology and the astronomy being done at the South Pole. Find Antarctic Extremes on PBS Terra, PBS Digital Studios' new science channel. Check out the episode in the description below and tell them, politely, that Spacetime sent you. We skipped last week's comments, so today I'm going to address both our episodes on the role of conscious observation in quantum mechanics and on quantum decoherence as a better path to understanding the measurement problem. Ritterbahn points out that the different matter configurations between experimental apparatus and the brain of different observers means decoherence should proceed differently along those paths. So why do different observers always agree on the result of the experiment? Well, Vampiricon answers this partially, saying that each observer will be on one decohered branch of the wave function. Each decohered branch will have its own set of observers. In other words, not all observers agree on experimental outcomes, it's just you never meet the ones who don't agree with you. So this explanation works in the context of the many worlds interpretation. You have sets of observers who make consistent observations and who are unaware of observers on other wave function branches who make different observations. Decoherence doesn't determine which experimental outcome you will see. All it does is ensure that you won't see multiple outcomes at the same time. You won't see macroscopic quantum superpositions. It ensures that sensible and consistent macroscopic realities are observed across each branch. We're going to explore this in much more detail next week when we look at the role of quantum entanglement in decoherence. Eddie Box on the Spacetime Discord asked about the quantum eraser, as did several people on the comments. Eddie Box asks whether the eraser experiment reintroduces coherence somehow. Well, the answer is essentially yes. In a typical quantum eraser experiment, you use entangled photon or other particle pairs. One of the pairs goes through the double slit experiment and the other carries information about which slit was traversed. The entanglement is the very first step in the decoherence chain, which ultimately spreads relative phase information to the environment in an irreversible way. But in the quantum eraser, we haven't reached true decoherence. Relative phase information is spread across only the two entangled particles and so decoherence is reversible. The exact mechanism varies by quantum eraser experiment, but this is true even in the infamous delayed choice quantum eraser, which is absolutely not as mystical as it seems. I'll expand on that another time because I guess it deserves its own episode. G.H. Oxen asks whether the double slit experiment is usually performed in a vacuum, and if not, why does an interaction with gas cause immediate decoherence? Well, these days, double slit experiments are usually done with single photons or other particles. These are difficult to produce and precious, so you don't want to be losing or disturbing them by interactions with the air. So yeah, most double slit experiments are done in near vacuum. 
But actually, most visible light photons will travel the length of a typical double slit experiment without actually scattering off air particles. And more minor interactions don't necessarily decohere the light, instead they introduce small phase shifts that can blur out the interference pattern without destroying it. Remember that the first double slit experiment was performed by Thomas Young in 1801, and there wasn't much in the way of vacuum technology. You can also prove it to yourself right now. Place two fingers in front of your eye with a tiny gap and look towards the light. You can see bright and dark fringes of Fraunhofer diffraction. Now, some of you may recall that this is also the official salute to identify yourself as someone capable of seeing the wave function, aka a space-time nerd. Nick Lucid, over at the Science Asylum channel, is pleased that we share his annoyance at horrible misuse of quantum mechanics to promote pseudoscientific nonsense. As Nick says, quantum mechanics is not magic. And to quote another one of the greats, Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Likewise, any sufficiently unintuitive science is indistinguishable from magic. And of course, we have a long history of unscrupulous charlatans taking advantage of that fact, whether to sell snake oil or books on quantum healing or $80 crystal-infused water bottles. When confronted with clues to the greatest mysteries of the universe, are you going to be like, hmm, how can I obscure these cosmic insights in order to trick people out of a bit of cash? Huh, fundamental insights into reality? Bit of cash. Tough choice. O Steve suggests that a more interesting question than does consciousness influence quantum mechanics is the other way around. Does quantum mechanics influence consciousness? Well, I can verify that it does. Despite my fascination with the subject, I've dozed off in many quantum mechanics lectures. Quantum unconsciousness achieved. 